Well, let's take our Bibles this morning and turn to the book of 1 John. The book of 1 John, I'm going to read uh, all the scripture that we have been looking at so far and then uh, review a little bit from last time and get into where we are today. Uh, we're looking at the title, When Sin Meets Forgiveness. When Sin Meets Forgiveness. 1 John chapter 1. And I'll read verses 1 through 10. 1 John chapter 1, 1 through 10. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father, and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him, and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Let us pray. Father, we thank you this morning for this special little love letter, the book of 1 John, that uh, you had the Apostle John write uh, to us, the believers, the family of God. As we look at this, help us to remember that's who this is written to. and We need to keep that in mind all the way through. And so we ask today that you would, you would lead us uh, in our study, that you would magnify Christ and his power and his ability to save and to, to give us eternal life. And, and this life, as we read, is in his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we ask that today that there will be millions of people who are going to understand that and who are going to get that and are going to believe it. And again, uh, before we get into the word, Father, we do want to lift up uh, our people who are in great need right now. And we ask that you would be bringing healing and strength and power and everything that they need uh, to be restored. And we ask that you would do that and that you would do that mightily on our behalf. So help us to, to pray hard uh, today and through this coming week uh, for our, our folks who are in great need of your help right now. So fill me, Holy Spirit, uh, direct uh, my thoughts uh, in the message today. Uh, we would see Jesus. We, we would see his power and his love and his might. Uh, we, we want to see what you have for us today. And we do pray that uh, as your children here at Faith Chapel, that you would enable, empower, prompt, and influence us uh, to, to really look hard into our hearts and to be fussy and to be very sensitive to your moving and, and your bringing to mind what needs to go and, and to get out and to be confessed and gone, uh, that we can really uh, be the servants of Christ that you would have us to be, that we would be very, very much like you. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. We began our study, uh, this last study, by thinking on the great actor, Woody Allen, uh, the Jewish man who was born November 30, 1935, in New York City. 
and he was asked that question, if you could hear from God anything, what would you want to hear? And he said, if there is a God who should speak to me, I, I would most want to hear him say three words. You are forgiven. And so as believers this morning in this wonderful love letter that we are looking at, 1 John, we know something. We know we have received Jesus as our Savior and we are forgiven. We have said what we need to say. I am a sinner. I am lost. I believe what you did for me, Lord Jesus, on the cross of Calvary. I believe that you shed your blood there to pay for my sin. I believe that you rose again from the dead. And I know that I am born again. It is a, a wonderful thing to know that today. And I was reminded again in the society in which we live, the world in which we live, there are so many now that don't know anything about Jesus. Nothing. We're in our third generation now where the Bible has not been read in the public school. A lot of damage has happened in those three generations just for that, from that one thing of removing the eternal word of God from the ears from our children who need it so, so desperately. In our first point, uh, we're looking at God is light. God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. And we said that God is absolute perfection, absolute holiness, absolute purity. And John finishes verse 5 and saying, and in him is no darkness at all. And I hope you remember this. We talked about that being a double negative. John, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is driving home the fact that there is no darkness in him, none. Double negative, none. And we also brought up the wonderful passage of assurance in John 10, 28. And they shall never perish. Another double negative. Never. No, not ever. Take it to the bank. It is yours forever and ever and ever. So we're going to move on now in point. I'm going to finish up point number one this morning. You know, the basis of our fellowship with God is the character and the nature of God. I want to remember that sin radically affects our fellowship with God. It is sin that disrupts our fellowship. It is sin that builds a wall between us and God. And since we are saved... Satan can't do anything about that. We are children of the king here this morning. We are born again. We are believers, and Satan cannot change that. But what can he do? He can work hard to get the children of God to walk in darkness. He wants to get us back to that. He does not want us to walk in the likeness of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants to destroy our fellowship with God and with other believers. So if he can get us back to sin, if he can get us back to darkness, if he can get us back to the old sinful habits, he can mess our relationship up with the Lord and with each other. And one way he does that is he will get people to start missing church. And they'll miss one week. And they'll miss two weeks. And then they'll, oh, you know what, I'll miss the third. And next thing you know, the fellowship with God and with the church has been hampered and hindered. And Satan just rejoices when that happens. You cannot allow that to happen. So sin radically affects our fellowship with God. In 1 John 1, 1 to 4, 
Our fellowship with God and with others is a key theme. The fellowship with God and with others. And in verses 6 through 10, John continues in that same key theme. And in these verses, six, uh, 5 through 10, 6 through 10, we see that John has a series of pairs. You may have noticed this already. These verses contain a series of six conditional sentences in three pairs of negative falsehoods. Uh, chapter 1, verses 6, 8, and 10, each followed by a positive truth, verses 7, 9, and chapter 2, verse 1. Three times John expresses a statement of what someone could say about their sin expressed in these three words, if we say. Let's look at that quickly. If we say, in verse number 6, that's the negative. All right, verse number 6 is negative, 7 is positive, 8 is negative, 9 is positive, 10 is negative, chapter 2, 1 is positive again. But we see in verse 6, if we say, and then again in verse number 8, same thing. If we say, in verse number 10, if we say, and they are negative statements. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Now let's remember that again, that John is writing to us. He is writing to the believers. And so as you read these verses, you can't get caught in another trap of the devil, which he'll say, well, now, if that's you, well, then you must have lost your salvation. Well, if that's you, you must be, not be saved. And that is the farthest thing from the truth. And then in verse 8, he says, if we say that we have no sin, we all, we all know this morning, we do. <laughs> if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. And in verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. I am I'm a backsliding Christian. I am not where I need to be. I am not being like my Savior the way I ought to be. And so when you look carefully at the three, you discover an unusual progression of thought. Each of these three statements is a shot across the bow of every Christian for whom the word sin was beginning to lose its meaning. So John is writing to the church, and the believers in the church that he was writing to were starting to put a lot less emphasis and reality, and I need to deal with the sin in my life. They were getting away from that, and they were tolerating sin. And it wasn't, oh, it's not all that bad, and I can still maintain my fellowship with God while I'm doing these sins over here, walking in darkness. Does that make sense? That doesn't work, does it? <laughs> if I'm involved in darkness, I am not in fellowship with God, and I am not in fellowship with the church either. John is writing here to Christians who are not taking sin seriously enough. I submit to you this morning, that is the problem from the Atlantic to the Pacific. And that is why the church is in desperate need of revival. Now remember, we're alive so we can be revived. We are not dead. We are alive unto Christ. But we can get to the point where those uh, folks were all the way back at the beginning of the church. Not taking our sins seriously enough. So talk and walk go together in the Christian life like the two wings of an airplane. We need both of those wings, folks. Uh, if I'm going down the runway and I'm looking out the window and I see that one of those wings is gone, I will do my best to stop that plane. I don't know if I could. 
But I would do my best because I know we're going to have a major problem the faster we go down that runway. We're going to have a plane wreck, and it's not going to be pretty. And so talk and walk go together. If our life does not match biblical truth, something is amiss in our Christian life. There is a huge gap between cheap talk and an authentic walk. Huge gap between that. So in our first point, God is light. Point number two, walk in the light. Walk in the light. So first, God is light, and secondly, walk in the light. If someone claims to be in fellowship with God, and yet the way he lives is characterized by sinful behavior, he is lying through his toothy grin and not practicing the truth. That is verse number six. If we say that we have fellowship with him, with Christ, and walk in darkness, we're lying. We lie and do not the truth. We're saved people, but we're walking in darkness, and we are lying if we say that I am walking in the truth. There is no doubt that genuine believers in the church are under the delusion that their sinful lifestyle is somehow compatible with fellowship with God. And it is not. One of the common New Testament metaphors to describe conduct or behavior is the word walk. Walk. And John is talking about our walk. Walk in the light. The word walk expresses the notion of behavior, of conduct, of our lifestyle, the way we live. So to, quote, walk in darkness is the opposite of walking in the light. The tense of the verb walk is present, right now and conveys habitual lifestyle. You cannot walk in darkness and be practicing the truth at the same time. Notice here that the truth is not only something to be believed, it is something to be lived out. The truth we know from the Bible is to be lived out out in our life. How does we lie differ from not practicing the truth? When our words don't match our life, we are not putting the truth of what we say, we believe into action. Hence, we in essence are lying. And when you observe that in yourself, you may observe that in others, you know exactly what's going on. We're lying and we're not doing the truth. We can deceive people sometimes, but we will not deceive our awesome God. What does John mean by truth? When John speaks of truth in his letter, he uses the word in two primary senses. Number one, true teaching. That is the true message of the Bible. And secondly, actions consonant with the true message. So we have a true message and we have actions in the life that agree with the true message of the word of God. So in this context, John is using truth to refer to the true message, the true doctrine, the true teaching. A big question concerns whether John intends us to understand his statement to apply to Christians or to unbelievers. 
Now, I think you can answer that one right away. You, we've already discussed it this morning. He's talking to the believers here. The whole book, he is talking to the believer. The letter is written to the believers, to the Christians, to those who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. The issue is whether a true believer can walk in darkness. And the answer is yes. Yes. We need to consider two truths. Number one, if someone within the church lives contrary to the gospel on a regular basis, there is a good reason to question the genuineness of his or her conversion. Number two, it is possible for Christians to sin, to live in periods of carnality, and yet be truly saved. The Bible affirms both of these realities. So reality one is I'm a believer and I'm walking in darkness, and the second is the reality that I am a believer and I am walking as close to Christ and his word as I possibly can. Both of those are on the shelf. Notice that John says, we lie. Who's we? It's we believers. We lie and do not the truth if we are walking in darkness. John says, we lie. About what? about being in fellowship with God while walking in darkness. So we cannot be in fellowship with God while we are walking in darkness. Furthermore, we are not practicing the truth when we are walking in darkness, are we? He does not say we do not know the truth. Okay? He does not say that we do not know the truth. We do know the truth. We know the truth. And even unbelievers in this world, they know the rules. They know the law. But they, like us, we can choose to disobey all of that, right? And in that, we are in the same boat. Imagine someone who is in a, a member of a health club. And this person attends all the club's nutritional meetings. But when he is not at the health club, he binges on all the wrong food. He comes to the next meeting and he says, Today, I ate a handful of cranberries and one fresh pear. Liar, liar. The truth is, he had a Big Mac and supersized the fries and the Coke. That's the reality that he's in. The truth is, he ate a Big Mac and supersized the fries and the Coke. It's a sad situation when a Christian claims the moral high ground, but what God sees is a Big Mac and supersized fries and Coke in our life. Okay? So we, and, and it's a, a glaring thing, okay? <laughs> Even the little stuff, it gets to be very glaring. What are we doing? We're languishing in the pit. If we say we have fellowship with God, yet our life is lived in the darkness of sin and not in the light of the truth, we are liars and not doing the truth. John listened carefully always to what Jesus had to say. Always. I mean, he was glued to his elbow. Wherever they went, he was right there with the Savior. And, and what does John do here? He pretty much repeats the words of Jesus in John 3, 21, which says, But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. So what we want in our life is we want everything that we do to manifest itself as being wrought in God, wrought from God. John speaks about a practical lie. The person who lies in this way 
is not only speaking a lie, but is acting a lie. The action is there. His life is a practical falsehood. Walking in darkness is itself the lie, an acted untruth. Light and darkness are mutually exclusive, both. Walking in darkness is exclusive to darkness. Walking in the light is exclusive to light, to the holiness, to purity. They cannot coexist. Light and darkness cannot coexist. At night, when you turn out the lights, darkness comes. When you turn on the light, darkness is dispelled. So, walking in darkness is the equivalent of walking in sin. You have to be careful about walking in darkness because you can easily get hurt when you're walking in darkness. Getting up in the middle of the night can be a dangerous activity. You could trip over something on the floor. You could run your toes into some unidentifiable object. If you have children, you may come upon a Lego. And that is not fun. It is dangerous. You could crack your head open on the door jam going out of the bedroom to the bed. It is, it is a dangerous thing. It does not pay to walk in darkness. It doesn't pay. Walking in darkness can mean committing any sin, great or small, anything. Hiding in the cover of night is what murderers do. They're not lurking in the daytime. They're looking for, they're going to wait. They're going to get you in the dark. They'll come out. You don't know they're there. And they can, and they kill their innocent victims. People sit looking at the wrong things on the internet. They sit looking at the wrong things on the television and on their phone. Darkness involves lying to the IRS. Darkness involves hating your neighbor. Darkness involves defrauding your employer. Darkness involves wasting precious time given to you by God. Darkness involves neglecting personal Bible study and prayer, or a million other things. People rename their sins so that they don't sound so bad. Isn't that the thing today in, in our government? Renaming. I won't go there, but I'll rename things that we, we can do. A person is not lazy, they're motivationally disposed. A shoplifter is a cost-of-living adjustment specialist. Sin is sin. I don't care what you call it. What label they give. In verse number 7, John presents the opposite scenario. Verse number 7. But if we walk in the light... As he, Jesus, is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Walk in the light. If we conduct our lives in the light, that is, if we live godly lives and behave as Christians should behave, because that is how God conducts himself, then we have fellowship one with another in the church as well. We are to walk in the light as God is in the light. So walking and light are two metaphors that speak of living in the sphere of truth and holiness. Verse number 5 says, God is light, 
And now verse number 7 says, God is in the light. God is light, and everything he does is in the light in terms of total purity and holiness. For us to walk in the light as God is in the light indicates likeness, but not degree. When you walk in the light, you're indicating a likeness to God, but it's not the same degree as God's perfection. But we're aiming at that. The light of God's nature is pristine holiness. It is untainted by sin. We can never walk in the light to that degree. We can never walk in the light to the degree that Jesus walks in the light. We're human beings and we sin. And that's why we have these verses that we're looking at. Sin is a problem. But we can walk in the likeness of that light. And when we do, it is very discernible to brothers and sisters in Christ and it is very discernible to the lost. Whenever you were at work, and if you, if you were at work and you lived for God, it was discerned by your co-workers. They knew. They know who you are. Why? Because you're walking in the light. You're not walking in darkness like they are. You are walking in the light. Now, how do we walk in the light? Psalm 119, 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The Bible teaches us how to live day by day in a way that pleases God and avoids sin. We need the lamp. We need the light all the time. We need it. When I read and study the Bible, I discover where my life contradicts Scripture. And I can make the proper spiritual adjustment. Let me read that and change a word. When you read and study the Bible, you will discover where your life contradicts Scripture, and you can make the proper spiritual adjustment. We've got to have the lamp. We've got to have the light going in our life. Furthermore, our ultimate reason for obeying the Word of God is our love for Christ. Our love for Christ. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, John 14, 15. If we walk in the light, two things will result. Number one, we have fellowship one with another, verse 7. Now let's stop there for a moment. Does that statement seem odd? For John to bring up right away, we have fellowship one with another. Isn't he missing something? Shouldn't have he gone somewhere else first? The expected consequence is we have fellowship with God. You would think that should be first. Not we have fellowship one with another. Why does John not say anything about fellowship with God here and yet speaks of fellowship with one another. And the answer is that fellowship with God is already assumed to be true in your life. It's already assumed. Since John says, we walk in the light. And fellowship among Christians is a sign that they have fellowship with God already. So, as we walk this pilgrim pathway, as we conclude the service, as we leave here today, as we talk to one another going out the door, we're going to have some fellowship going on. And so, if our fellowship is really sweet in the Lord and with each other, the assumption can be made, I'm walking with God. 
I'm already walking in the truth. Therefore, we have fellowship one with another. That's what John is getting at. Now, next week, we're going to unpack this word fellowship some more. For now, let us focus for this coming week on walking in the light as he, Jesus, is in the light. May that be our focus all week long, that we're walking in the light as Jesus himself is in the light. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. We give you praise this morning for this powerful letter written to us, the dear children of God. We ask, Lord, that as we peel back the layers of this, this precious book and look deeply into its wording, that you would grow us in might and power and oneness with you and with one another. We know that that's what the Christian life is, is all about. So, Father, may we focus, uh, help our, our lives. Let us look at that light and walk in the light of the Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.